Hi everyone, I am Wells Frey Smith and I am a curator in London and I am so excited to be here today with Kujo Marfo, Hi. who's an exceptional painter working in London and we are here in his studio and you can see we are surrounded by his work, this great double portrait behind us and another piece between us here. Kujo is known really for painting figures that are at the intersection of different worlds. They're not quite men, not women, not black, not white. They might be located in Africa, but also India, Europe. They bring together European tradition as well as his contemporary vision today. So we're gonna deep dive into his work, his process and his influences all for the Institutum. So Kujo, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you all. When you're imagining a painting or coming up with it, can you tell me a little bit about your process? Are you really just using these images from your imagination? Are you picking up on things that you're seeing in the street here? Are you referencing books, photographs? How do you bring these figures and these compositions all together? Usually I don't have any preconceived notion of what I'm doing. Incidents. It could be anything. It could be something I've seen on TV or uh, someone that I know probably may call me and tell me a story. But then when I hear these stories, then I go back. My mind will then take me back. Because what happens is when I hear these stories, it's like, I want to paint something to relate to this issue. Yeah. How do I do it? There are times I'll be sitting here and I'm facing a canvas and I could sit here for long and planning, thinking, because that's when the mind takes me to so many places and images that I have seen and can I incorporate this image into my work? Can I do this or do that? So usually the mind will be traveling, going round, round, round. So there are times too I'll just put paint on a brush and then make some... Straight onto the canvas. Yeah, and then just no make... Drawing, no drawing, no sketching. Nothing at all. And then just do things. But what happens is these things I create... I'll go like mad with um, on the canvas and then leave it and go straight to bed and then come back to it. And there are times I could sit and stare at what I have done and then I could find images in there. So we're sitting in your studio in London and you can see behind Kujo here is a representation that's quite typical of your work. So we have these stylized figures with very identifiable faces, uniquely, I would say, in your style. I wanted to ask about your figures and if they are located in any place specific or where they may come from. The figures in general, how I got the idea, inspiration and everything comes from Ghana, my hometown. I just feel like there are times, um, I say an African and a Ghanaian to be precise and a Kwa woman to be actually, to be on the spot. I kind of feel like Whenever I start talking about art or whenever I decide to create image, the image yeah. has to have a connection with me. It has to have a relationship. So initially when I started painting, I was actually painting people. Mm -hmm. It got to a point I realized that I'm only painting someone that eventually the person may not like it or even if they like it, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. So that is the main reason why I decided that I'll go back to Ghana well, I, I didn't actually go there to do my own research. I just went on social media and on the internet. And then I found this image, um, this carving that actually I grew up seeing a lot. It was called, it, it is called Fertility Doll. Mm. And mm. this doll um, were given to women um, when they reach childbearing age. Mm. And um, all those who want to conceive. And apparently it helps them to actually conceive and stuff like that. So... And I saw a lot when I was growing up at home. They were all littered everywhere. So I just, I look at them and I was like, I could actually use these images rather than um, painting someone and then telling their story. Because the truth of the matter is, you want everyone, culture, race to be reflected in whatever you do. I mean, it's fine. I mean, there are European artists who are happy to paint only Europeans. There are African artists who are happy to paint only Africans. Because they are, what they want to talk about, those images fit in perfectly well. I want to talk about things that doesn't actually station in one area. I want to be able to talk about issues in China. I want to be able to talk about issues in India. We live in a world where the media highlights every incident in any world. So why can't I also highlight the beauty in humanity? It's a really interesting take on, 
identity politics and I think the politics of representation that's happening now where there's a huge appetite for black artists portraying black figures and we tend to I think fix artists in certain categories and tell them what they aren't and aren't allowed to show and to represent and it seems like you are carving your own path within that wave. Yeah, I've noticed it and it's been going on for the past almost five, six years. Sometimes you really feel like I don't want to fall into a fad where I feel like I am being elevated based on the fact that I'm a black person or African to be precise. I don't want to be elevated based on that. I just feel like if somebody's going to like what I do, it should be based on um, the fact that I'm doing something that they appreciate. In another 20 years, we're all going to be old. And um, I just want the 20 year old kid or the 18 year old girl to actually look at it and go, like, oh, this man was actually talking about something important back in those days. I don't want to be in a position of coming back to change something and reinterpret it and try to kind of find ways and means to squeeze myself out of a trouble that I have created way back and then <laughs> it's coming back because everything that we're doing now will be uncool another 20, 50 years time yeah. and I don't want to be part of it. No. Well, I think the singularity of your vision is very clear. And what is so powerful, I think, about these is that uh, and for your show at J.D. Mallet, you had, I think it was eight individual portraits, uh, all called Stranger, that bore similar features. So they looked in some ways the same, but of course they were all completely different in their colors, their backgrounds, their clothes. So they feel strongly like individuals, but in their similar features, it's as though each one is, is a kind of surrogate for the human condition. Mm -hmm. The Stranger series is about people that come across met in this melting pot. Some of them were really nice people, some were not. <laughs> and you know, yeah. I'm sure, which were. Yeah, all sort of different characters I met. There were gonna be 10 series, but we didn't have enough space, mm. so we did nine, and I think the 10th one went to uh, Chris's. Great. I decided to remove everything that will suggest that that images were like, this gender or that gender mm. or that guy or black or white. Mm. The colors actually I put in there was to highlight how different we are as humanity, but there's something that links all of us together. So you may know, I may know, like we all meet people that we may not like them, but they also got the right to live in this world. We did not create them. Even though some of the people I met, I didn't like them. I decided that rather than painting James, Michael, Evelyn, Juliet, and tell their story. I'm just gonna make all of them one because the behavior that I go from James or Juliet, I may also give that same behavior yeah. to somebody else too. Yeah. So I just thought, I'm not gonna paint James some kind of evil person or paint Juliet an evil person. I'd rather make James and Juliet all look the same. My plan was to actually produce images that represent humanity, that represent all sides of us. So yeah, everyone in there, I know who they are. Yeah. They don't know, but I know them. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to ask about this hybridity that you talked about, mm -hmm. not making gender specific and painting men or women, also not making race specific mm -hmm. and having black and white. We see that quite literally, I think, in mm -hmm. your representations. It complicates the reading of people mm -hmm. being one thing or the other, right? Cultural hybridity is, Something that I always sort of like, I use that word a lot. I live here, I lived a bit in America and I, obviously I was born in Ghana. Rather than station or making my artwork look like this is an African artwork from Kwau, to make these images look like a representation of these people in Africa, whereby they don't have anything to do with what I do. Mm. These images don't represent the guy in Ghana, doesn't represent the guy in North America, but I just feel like I'm going to use the images to talk about everyone's story. Yeah, yeah. And then what I decided to do, by doing that, I decided to take symbols from each culture. So I just feel like I want everyone's um, identity or culture uh, to reflect or to show that reflection in my work. So I decided that, well, I'm going to take something from India, something from Ghana, something from North America, 
Europe and everywhere. Why don't you just come up with this suggestion that your work is cultural hybridity? Yeah. It's not about Evelyn, it's not about Michael, it's not about anyone. It's just about Kujo's interpretation of um, mm. the world we live in. Well, I think there's great power in that, Thank especially you. in this moment when we have been so politically polarized mm -hmm. and I think the media in particular likes to highlight difference instead of any type of hybridity, actually, right? A kind of in-between position. And I see a lot of your work occupying this in-between because it also, to me, really mixes historical imagery also with your own contemporary vision. These are some of the things that comes into my mind. So when I look at, when I decide to pick something from Elizabethan or any of this sort of symbol, I'm not doing something beautiful, basically. I'm trying to actually highlight everybody's individual culture yeah. in my work so that everyone feels a bit more easy with me because the reality is I'm, I'm only trying to build a social cohesion. I think that's the word. Yeah. And um, Absolutely. my idea is not to actually divide anybody and my mm -hmm. idea is not to make anyone feel com uncomfortable. So even though the idea behind my work comes from my hometown, identity doesn't play any part in my work. No. I don't use my identity as um, a tool for anything because uh, my identity is my identity and um, I'm proud of it. I, haven't, I have nothing to, to lose or gain if I use my identity to actually play any part in whatever I do. Mm. I know that Picasso and Leger and some of those Cubist artists yeah. have been an influence or Big they influence. are heroes for you. Yeah. But one thing that strikes me is that they, when they came to prominence, the way that they shifted ground in art history was to show things from many different viewpoints, quite literally an object from different viewpoints and angles at once. And it seems to me that you are doing that in your own way because you're bringing in, as you talk about, you know, things you've seen in Ghana, Elizabethan references with the rough, these cows different- Cows from yes, India. We, the, the cows um, from India. The big years from East Africa. You're asking your viewer basically to take all these different positions and use them and bring them all together. So is that right? Yeah, it is right. And then also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of like playing tricks with the viewer. Yeah. Because I want the viewer to stand there in front of this artwork and then start searching for things. And then the more they look deep, they will find something in there that relates to them. Mm. So usually, what I get, somebody will send me a message. Oh, I saw your work and it reminds me of this place. It reminds me of this place. And also, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> if that's what you found, then that's beautiful. Yeah. So that has always been my plan to play this game of, um, let me get this thing from here, let me get that from here, mm. let's put that one together. Simplified it. So I always make sure that I take the simplistic symbol from every culture, nothing too deep for anyone to see that culture in there. Viewer is the person who's gonna point out what they've seen. Mm. Because a lot of people, in, in fact, most people, when they see something that, a reflection of their culture, they see it instantly. When anything anyone looks at it, they see that. Uh, yeah, that that's is, the confirmation yeah. bias. Or, yeah. You know. yeah, yeah. People will see it straight away. If you see someone playing around with that culture, you be like, oh, this guy, he's, he reminds me of this. He reminds me of that. So that's the only the reason I do them. The reason why I pick things from different cultures is to make everyone feel like their culture is reflected mm. in my mm. work. Mm. I'm not taking it to own it. I can't own anything. Everything in this world doesn't belong to anybody. But people do see things that relate to them and automatically they kind of like yeah. have a connection. Yeah. So my plan is to make everyone connect with my artwork and feel a bit more safe with it. I want to ask you about this Elizabethan ruff specifically because that was a garment that was worn throughout Europe really in the 16th and 17th yeah. centuries, as you know. Yeah. But at least in the UK is in some ways very associated yeah. with class yeah. and social Correct. status. Talk to me about class and status and and tell me about how, how you think that through in the work. When I was researching, going deep into um, what I should put in and what I shouldn't put in, I started thinking that, why don't you also delve into the European kind of aristocratic status thing. 
bring them out. Just bring yeah. them out. Create them in your own understanding. Don't make them um, exactly as what it is. Then you haven't done anything. Just bring them out. Do what Picasso did. You also recreate them. And then use them to actually start a conversation. Yeah. What also came into my mind whilst I was creating this is to actually highlight issues that I have seen. Mm. Highlight the difference between the people the people who live in this country and the people who come from where I come from. So for instance, that was just, I was sort of like trying to talk about single parent food. Mm. I did not hear this word single parent when I was growing up. I don't think we have a word like that in our language. <laughs> single mother. <laughs> doesn't exist. I think, no, it doesn't ex exist. We don't have a single mother word. Mm. There's no such thing as single mother. Is that because you live in, in community? Yes. The women are the people who call the shots, not the men. So the women are like the boss. The, the grandmother is the head of the family, mm. not the man or the uncle or the grandmother becomes. But the men are also there to support them. So I was looking into it and I was asking myself, like, um, how do you talk about single parent, compare the single parent over here and then the single parent over there? And then I started thinking, here it's like, Single parents are seen as poor and um, can't afford anything and um, they're struggling. And then over there too, I never heard my mom complain about anything. Mm. And um, I live good. <laughs> mm. So I was trying to delve into it, but at the same time I was very careful because um, each society have their own little problems they deal with. So don't go and uh, tackle any issues that you don't actually have an idea. But at the same time I was like comparing the single mother in my culture is a rich woman yeah with everything yeah. well not super rich like having mansions but i try to sort of make it easy for people to understand that if you divorce her before she gets into the marriage you have to get, give her this give her a house give her cows and when you divorce her she's financially secured so this is a painting about a woman and her riches correct in a way so tackling a um, single mother i just thought that it's a bit too cliche so said to make it look more like a widow um, with a lot of um, wealth. So that which I was based on two different sort of um, systems, but I used the class system to actually highlight the the difference between my culture and the culture I live in over here. Here, mm. yeah. It's a great painting to talk about animals yeah. and your relationship with animals and how, how they come into the work. And we have another example. This is the yeah. work you made for Aspinall's that has this bird on the yeah. right. But one of the ways in which your painting breaks down boundaries often is that the figures and the animals are treated equally. They're given the same amount of space on the canvas, you use the same technique. They too are also in riches. So the animals wear pearls, wear jewelry, like the figures do. So it seems to me that you're making almost a statement about treating animals in a similar way t to how we might treat humans and treat each other but i'd be interested to know your approach yeah animals i mean i'm coming from a background where i mean as a kid i had a lot of pets so a lot of things that i incorporate in my work things that i grew up seeing or owning I always have love for animals even though i ended up working as a butcher <laughs> <laughs> my mind takes me back to my childhood and the things that were the things that brought joy to a lot of people's faces to see a little bright colored bird flying is is amazing. I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of stories about animals and the lion and all this. I never actually physically saw them, mm. but the old folks will tell me all these stories. These are things that I could actually use them to actually talk. And they, they, they actually walk hand in hand with human beings. They are minding their own business, obviously. We have taken a lot of their land. Yeah. So I try to bring them into my work to highlight the difference, also to highlight the love we have for them. But some of these animals too are for wealth. Like the cows um, are a status thing. If you have a lot of cows, you're actually a rich person. Mm. In so many cultures, in, in India, for instance, um, some of these cows are worshipped. Where I come from, the north, they use them to plow the land. Um, they use cows to plow the land. So they actually do a lot for humanity mm. than what we give to them mm. because 
the cow, for instance, will plow the land. You plant um, a lot of whatever seeds on it, and then um, they ended up on people's table as well. Yeah. These animals don't complain. Well, and so as, as a symbol, it, it has to do with wealth. It has mm -hmm. to do with status, respect. I just thought, why can't I just bring these animals into our conversation for us to know the hypocrisy? We think we are the mighty ones, but they do a lot for us than we do for them. And um, personally, I feel like animals have a lot mm -hmm. in common with humanity, but we don't see it like that because we are the mighty ones. So we, we control their existence. They don't control us. So, Kujo, I know that you haven't trained formally in art schools and in a formal art system. So I wonder how you came into art and into making paintings. I struggled to actually um, fit into the normal 9 to 5 sort of concept. But growing up, I've always been interested in creating images that kind of doesn't fit into any concept. I've always been that guy who wants to create something that people will look at it and laugh or people will look at it and not really understand what is going on in this world. Because what I wanted to do is I always want to do something different. So when I moved to the West, I have to unlearn a lot of things. I have and to... this was in the late 1990s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically whatever I've learned growing up in Ghana and I moved to the West, I have to unlearn everything, literally, like basically. You have to unlearn everything. What is right in your country, you move into a different country, it's not right anymore. So whilst I was learning, I realized that um, I do not fit into a group. I, I realized that I'm an individualistic person and I always love to um, express my individuality. It may not sit well with some people, but um, I realized that that was me. So at what point did you start painting? What I year? I took painting serious, I think 2013. 2013. But that was when I was actually trying to discover myself. Because most of the things I do, I always experiment, experimentation in some kind of way. There wasn't any direction at that point. It was like walking to this gallery, walking here, walking there, ask questions. And um, nobody was giving me any directions. Mm. No one mm. was actually. So I gave up. And then around 2008, I came back again, full force. Because at that time, at that point, I've actually I messed myself with ideas and read a lot and then I was like, this is it. And the rest is history. The rest, as they say, is history because after are. 2008, I went in with force. I had ideas because at that point I've had rejections, rejections, rejections. And even some of the people were telling me, why are you painting people? Why don't you just go give the photo to the person you painted? So at that point, all the rejections and oh, dude, this is rubbish, this is that, that is that, kind of helped me too because and then it helped me to actually strengthen me. It makes me strong and also mm. gave me the idea that um, art is not actually about beauty. Art is not nothing to do with beauty, but the idea is about what you're projecting and what the story you want to tell is what people are interested in. Mm. So from there on, I decided to remove myself from the beauty side of art decided that I'm not actually here to project how beautiful somebody is. So everything changed around 2008. Yeah. Everything changed. But I think what made everything change was I kind of acquired a lot of um, knowledge about what I wanted to do. So looking back from 2003 to 2008, and I look, my mind takes me to the images I created. Some of them were pretty good images, but it was also good that I went through that. So from 2008, I went back to those images. Yeah. And then I started using a different method of telling people my story. Yeah. It's basically me selling ideas to people. Yeah. I love what you say about not being so interested in beauty, but being interested in the stories and imagining what's possible. There's a feminist author called Bell Hooks, and she says that the role of the artist isn't to represent what the world is, it's to present options for what the world could be. I removed the beauty from my work because um, it's very subjective. It's one of those things that the moment you start pushing yourself into that field, you're actually dividing people. Most of these images, looking at the one behind me, it takes you in. You, you see them and it, it draws you in. It's like, what is this? Why did the guy create it? Is he alright? Is he going through some trauma? The reality is I create them like that to draw people in and then they understand the story. Yeah. 
or they see something in there for them to question themselves. Usually a lot of people will look at it and then try and take their mind back to something they've seen before. I get that, oh, that's Picasso style, oh, that's Basquiat style. But there are people too who try to understand what is behind those images. Why are you creating all this? So personally, I just feel like, for me, it's about the image. There's no beauty in the, in the image, but the story that is behind the image. Because the image is there to draw you in, and then for you to listen to the story. Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Kojo, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming.